I was going to say this is like from the sublime to the ridiculous, <laughs> but actually it, it's not. I found so much that you said up there so applicable to what has happened and what I hope will happen, except maybe that letter you received that said, you know, that's going you know, like that. Uh, and, 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 and frankly, you know, if this was 30 years and 30 pounds ago, I would be in a lot better shape for this project. Uh, plus, I wouldn't have to have 18 point, you know, writing to see what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, but basically, what happened there with, with, with sh I'm going to sit this right here. Is this okay if I sit this right down here? Okay. Uh, uh, with the, the, the group of students that were just mentioned up there briefly, I, I, I'll, I'll kind of come back to that first. Nothing, nothing would have happened if it wasn't for those two people right there. Back in the day when Joe Trimmer first started the Virginia Ball Center, he brought me on to talk to uh, potential faculty who were going to develop projects. And I, I was doing immersive learning and building better communities before there was immersive learning and building better communities, because I don't know how else to live my life, because the arts to me are this and not this. And so when Joe asked me to participate in connecting with Virginia Ball Center folks, I said, great. He said, do you have an idea? And I said, no, I, you know, no, I really don't. And so I, I met with the, the different people. Ray Peterson and a few others were the first to uh, kind of jump in there with the Virginia Ball opportunity. And so, like I had said in the video, in the back of my mind, I was kind of waiting to put together the right kinds of people. And I think as I got older, I became more patient and I listened more instead of being so, you know, sometimes I'm not telling anybody in here who doesn't know this about yourself or with me is that sometimes you get so single minded, you move ahead that you, you lose all this magic that tends to be around you. And all of a sudden I'm older and I'm not quite so panicked about life somehow, although my daughter's 17 and that's worth a panic. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, but the, there, there was this sense of all of a sudden hearing and listening of, to people and things that I, I think I ran past before in my life. So anyway, so I met these magical students and put them together. And then as word went around, I get kids from TCOM and from art and dance. And all, all of a sudden, there was this magical group of 15 students. And, 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 but it would have stopped almost there, because our initial idea was to write a musical about the effects of 9-11. Because there were people in our community who's, who had a family member that had been killed or had been injured. And I thought, what a wonderful thing to kind of, but sad thing, do you know, to, anyway. So they talked about the circus. And, and so what happened, and this is how magical things can be. I said, they said, okay, the circus in winter. And I said, where did you hear about the book? Tony Edmonds taught the book in his humanities class. And several of the students had taken his class. And he is a remarkable teacher. If you, I'm sure many of you have seen or heard him, whatever. He's retired. Was Anyway, so, uh, so, so, I, so I called him up, I mean, like right then, and I said, Tony, I think we want to adapt this novel. And this is like 10 minutes after I, the kids had said they wanted to do it. I mean, I felt that, that much of a calling about it. So I, I, he said, well, here's Kathy Day's information. I'll give you your email. So I mean, right then and within an hour, Kathy and I were connected. Now, most people, if you say, I want to adapt your novel into a musical, will go, OK, and that'll be like $15,000. Talk to my agent. She said, well, talk to my agent. And she didn't charge us one cent. Not one cent. And all she asked in return was that she could come and listen and be a part of what was going on in, in the process. And it, it, and it proved to be uh, one of those remarkable moments because she reconnected kind of with Indiana. A few months later, a position opened up in creative writing in the English department. And our first performance on Ball State campus of the show, Kathy interviewed for that position and got it. I mean, that's, see, that's how absolutely remarkable and wonderful this whole process has been. So as we moved along, as you heard, we won several awards. And it was like, hooray, and stuff like that. And, but what most recently has happened, because I'm going to kind of jump ahead a little bit, 
after the, the National Alliance on Musical Theater, when we performed at that, Sutton Foster, which in many of your, your worlds is like whatever, whatever name, but in New York, in musical theater, she's like the Gwen Verdon, the Angel Lansbury of our generation. She's won two Tony Awards. She is, you know, she's a really remarkable person. And if you may know, she received an honorary degree here at Ball State last spring. Well, she and Ben, she had worked with us on the project and watched it, and so she agreed to participate. Well, when someone at that level agrees to participate in a creative project, you up the ante and your odds. I mean, it's like everyone go. there's an automatic buy-in. So when we performed a cut of the, uh, of the piece at the National Alliance last October, we got more responses than any show had ever gotten in its 40-year history. Not only that, but we were the only undergraduate program who had ever made it to the top eight, much less get that, that kind. Now, I'm just a visible partner of this project, because it was the students. I've just been, you know, saying, hey, hang a left, hang a right, you know, and I'm filling the gas of the van to keep it moving. That's, that's me. Uh, so after that performance, all these folks, and I'm like, what is going on? I mean, it was like I'm not in Kansas anymore. And uh, all of a sudden, they started saying things like, we'd like to produce it here in Chicago and LA. And uh, 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 uh. Well, luckily, this magic man named Sean Sarconi, who was a producer in New York, heard our music on the internet, contacted me, and he has kind of moved us now to this next level. Well, we were invited last February to Goodspeed. It's an opera house, which is a remarkable, historic, uh, kind of a kickoff point for a lot of professional musicals that happen. They invited us there for a kind of a two-week workshop to work on the script and music, et cetera. So we, yeah, we did, we did, we did, and then, this, this, this coming Saturday, this group of um, producers are meeting in New York and have selected four shows, new shows, to do a presentation uh, to respond to this, this new work. And Circus was selected as one of those four uh, productions. And if that is not enough to ch chap your butt, then <laughs> what happened it next is, they have this, you know, you've seen the, I don't know if you've seen the TV show, Smash. Well, it's kind of dopey, but it's a little true. And we are on May the 3rd, in fact, I leave for New York in a week. Uh, uh, we are doing a backers audition. Now, what that means is we have a, we do a full concert performance of the show, meaning sitting down with stands and singing and blah, blah, blah. And then these invited groups of producers, uh, owners of theaters, come and watch you, and then they bid on who gets to premiere your show. And I'm not talking about, you know, although I love Muncie Civic Theater, we're not talking about Muncie Civic Theater. We are talking, you know, the Chicago Shakespeare Group, or Dallas Theater Center, or McCarter Theater or Goodspeed. I mean, it is, this is crazy stupid. I mean, this is one of those things you go, how did this happen? And it's like we're caught in a wind tunnel and we can't, we can't make a mistake. I mean, that's how it feels right now. There is such a joyful experience that I, it, I, I don't know how to get out of it. Not that I want to, <laughs> although it is exhausting, but it's, it's still, it, it is absolutely remarkable. So as of May 3rd, we will know the next trajectory uh, of the show and the way that it is unfolding and what we have been told, because I don't know shit from Shinola, folks, when it comes to a lot of this stuff, is that we, they're looking at broad, a Broadway house in 2016. And I, I, and I, I kid you not. And so that is kind of, what is happening? Now, a week from this Thursday, which is the 25th, we will be doing a new reading of the, the, the new script prior to going to New York uh, at Cornerstone Center for the Arts, uh, 8 o'clock on the 25th, which is free and open to the public. Uh, to, so we get an idea with our students, because any chance I get 
to keep our students involved in an immersive learning, not only on campus, but for them professionally, I am doing. Because as the contract reads now in New York, I get final creative say, so I have a list of no choices in terms of my students who have graduated who are going to be part of the project no matter where it goes. So uh, it's uh, it, from a little quick moment of circus, Kathy Day, blah, 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 it has just, it has elevated a group of students and uh, frankly our department into an area that we, we, we never knew we, we could achieve or reach towards. And, and like I said in the, in the video, if it wasn't for people like the Discovery Group, the Virginia Ball Center, the Provost Immersive Learning Group, we, uh, we, never, we wouldn't have had the money, the funds, or the support to continue this project. And so I, there's just so many people even sitting in here that I, I, that I have to thank for all their, their, their support and guidance. And, and especially Joe and Kathy. The end, that's all I know. Thank you.